Harrison, and I'm glad you can join me tonight because my guest is a man whose whole world is a stage. On Broadway, television, in the movies, he has conquered them all. You have seen him on Broadway, the star of top musicals such as 42nd Street and Promises, Promises, for which he won a Tony Award. In the movies, you've seen him in Dirty Dancing, Crimes and Misdemeanors, FX, and Prince of the City, just to name a few. On television, he has starred in his own detective series. He often plays the bad guy. In real life, he's a good guy, talented, motivated, and successful. My guest is Jerry Orbach. We'll meet him right after these messages, so please stay right there. Marlene Hurston, and here we are in New York City at the Symphony Cafe, and my guest is Tony Award winner Jerry Orbach, star of stage, screen, and television, but uh, welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Nice to be here. I agree. Sitting at the bar at the Symphony Cafe. Yeah, it's always fun to sit in the bar at the Symphony Cafe. <laughs> okay, you know, we're here in the heart of the theater district, and actually, you, you started on Broadway. The first time I saw you was on the stage, Bigger Than Life, but you know, it's funny, because today, many people know you from, your, from movies rather yes. than Broadway. How, how do you feel about that? Well, it's quite a big difference. Uh, most of my career was spent on the stage, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, people thought of me, most people thought of me as a sort of song and dance man, a musical comedy performer, and never connected me with serious things or uh, straight acting. And I said, someday it's going to come around the other way, and it actually did. Uh, I was suggested for a uh, television series where the it's cops who break into song and somebody connected with the casting said oh he'd be a perfect type does he sing so <laughs> it has come around the other way okay you know it's interesting when they say do you sing because as I mentioned in the introduction you play the tough guy mm -hmm. and in real life quite frankly you look like a tough guy you don't look like anybody that's going to get up there and sing and dance <laughs> hey, you're six foot three I mean you know how, how did this happen how did Jerry Orbach become a musical comedy person? Uh, it was a strange uh, sort of backdoor thing. When I, was, when I was a kid in school, I was a very serious young actor. My idols were Marlon Brando and Montgomery Clift and people like that. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. But I sang. I sang in a choir in high school and I won a state singing contest and uh, things like that. And I loved singing. And when I got to New York, the first thing I got into was the Three Penny Opera, off Broadway in the Village, and then I did the Fantastics. And I kept working. I kept getting jobs in musicals. Then I did a Broadway show called Carnival. Okay, you're going too fast, okay? Because but I it, mean, that's where the work was. Okay, but it started before then, okay? Because I won't even go back before you got to, before you started to make money in, yeah. in show business, before people knew that you were a singer and a dancer. You were born in the Bronx. Uh, you moved to a little town in Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, Waukegan. Okay. <laughs> now, now that's, and your parents, very interesting people, because they are involved. How did, uh, were they the ones that first said, hey, our son has talent? Uh, not really, but uh, my mother was a singer, and I used to always sing with her when I was little. And then they asked me to get up and sing at a party or something. Uh, my father had had aspirations to be in vaudeville, to be a comic, uh, which the depression got in the way of, you know, he had to work, went into the restaurant business. So they had a fondness for, for music and for comedy and for everything else. And uh, they encouraged me once I started into it. But it seemed like even in grade school, I was always sort of picked for the class play or the puppet show or whatever the heck was going on. Yeah, yeah okay. And actually it fits, you know, whatever it was, it really <laughs> fits. But, but here you were. Okay, now you decided that, that this was what you were going to do. Yes. And you come back to New York. You leave Weekhogan? 
Waukegan. Waukegan. Jack okay. Benny's hometown. Okay. Very oh, famous. Right. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> but the Bronx I can pronounce. So that's yes. where you were born. Okay. That's, where I'm, that's where I was born, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, and you came back to New York City, which is where you live now, where you belong. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't happen overnight. You know, what happened? How did you support yourself? How did you live? How did you get into the business? Well, it's... Um, I graduated from high school when I was 16, and I uh, went right into summer stock out in Illinois, outside of Chicago. I had a high school drama teacher who got me a job as an apprentice, and I got into some of the shows during the summer. Then I went off to college, studying the theater and everything, and the next summer I got my equity card at 17. Then I went into a year-round stock company just north of Chicago and transferred to Northwestern. By that time, I had done by the third year, maybe 45 different productions in summer stock and acted in most of them and built scenery and done other things. Uh, by the time I got out of Northwestern, I had done maybe 70 shows and knew a lot of people in the business who lived in either in New York or Hollywood, you know. And uh, I had, a f had friends like Tom Poston, who, you know, on the Newhart show, Tom was my sort of mentor. And uh, when I came to New York, I did another season of stock in New Jersey. Uh, met people like uh, Ward Baker, who later directed The Fantastic. So I had a lot of contacts in the business as I came in. Okay, but you came to New York, and I, I hear that, that first, though, as it happens with so many people, you lived in a shabby apartment. Oh, sure. That you, your friend worked parties and brought home whatever food was left over. Sure. Uh, so you could have something to eat. <clears throat> there, was a, uh, there was a great little restaurant over on 52nd and 6th uh, where you could get ravioli, a bowl of ravioli for 40 cents. You know, and that and a glass of water was a meal. It was great. <laughs> okay, you know, it's funny to think of that because some people, because your last name is Orbach, some people that I know thought, oh, he has to be part of the rich Orbach family. No, they, there was a they spell it Orbachs. differently. They spell okay. it O-H-R, mine is O-R. Ah, uh, okay. We're the poor so. ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Living on 40 cents ravioli. But, you know, it didn't happen for long because big break. The big break was Three Penny Opera. I mean, I think that was probably, you know, no more 40 cents ravioli. Um, no, I went to the fabulous sum of $45 a week. At Three Penny Opera? Yeah. And when you covered a part that you were understudying, you got paid double for each performance. So there were some weeks when I made $90, which was unheard of. That was a lot of money in those days. <laughs> sure it was. <laughs> okay. Sure it was. Uh, but I did that for three and a half years, Three Penny. At the Three Penny Opera. Actually, I hear it was Joel Gray's wife. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, Joel's wife, uh, Joe Wilder, I had met in stock, and uh, she tipped me off that the guy playing the street singer was going on a two-week vacation. So I came in and uh, got the job as the replacement at the bright age of about 20. Okay, the only reason I mention that is because in Dirty Dancing, which so many ha of us have seen you in, uh, you played Jennifer Gray's dad, and that's Joel Gray's daughter. Yes. So it's very interesting that one of your, your major movies, because you were wonderful in that, uh, should be with Joel Gray's daughter, and your first real break came from a tip from Joel Gray's wife. We're going to take a break, <laughs> and we're going to find out where you went from there. Coincidence. <laughs> okay. We're at the Symphony Cafe uh, here at the bar with uh, Jerry Orbach, and we'll be right back after these messages, so stay right there. Person, and we're back. We're here at the Symphony Cafe with my very special guest, Jerry Orbach. We're here in New York City, right in the midst of a hubbub here at the Symphony Cafe. Yes, it's a matinee day, noisy and fun. Yeah, actually, and as I'm, it's fun to be with you, and it's even more fun uh, when I see you on stage. We mentioned Thank the the um, your first little break because you've done so many major things, but maybe the first big break came next, but it was by chance. You were off-Broadway, you were offered a part in a Broadway role, yet you took one in an off-Broadway role that probably changed your life. Tell us. Yes, I was, uh, well, I was out of work after Three Penny at some point, and uh, somebody offered me a musical that was coming into town called Lock Up Your Daughters for the fabulous sum of about $250 a week. Uh, and at the same time, I read The Fantastics. Uh, and decided, and I heard the music, and I decided I had to do that, even though it was, again, 45 bucks a week, like three penny. And the Fantastics, of course, uh, changed everything. That was the springboard for me. 
And the other play, I must mention, closed in no, one week? Yes, closed, <laughs> closed on the train somewhere between New Haven and Boston. I think. Okay, so boy, was that, was that smart, you well, know? Have you always been that smart in picking your roles? It's, I don't think it's a matter of being smart so much as uh, hopefully just doing the things that appeal to you, doing the things that you like when you can. Sometimes you have to do things for economic purposes, you know, but uh, if there's something that I really love when I see it on the page or I hear the music, uh, and I want to do it, then I don't worry about uh, am I being smart or not. I just go with my heart, you know. Okay, well, 42nd Street. I, I guess I know that was a, a while ago, but 42nd Street, I mean, I felt that nobody else could have played that part but you. You were really wonderful in well, it. Well, that's sweet. Thank but you. But you were in the role for four and a half, eight years, 1,929 performances. I didn't uh, know it was that many. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, as a matter of fact. Now, what happens? I mean, when you go on day after day, night after night in the same role, how, how do you keep fresh? Well, there are a lot of little tricks, but uh, the basic thing is that it's, especially when you're playing one of the leads in a show, it's your responsibility to keep it fresh for the audience every night. Uh, and there are a lot of ways of meeting that responsibility. Uh, one of them is uh, an example that, let's say you hear a terrific joke first thing in the morning at breakfast. And now you meet some people at lunch and you tell them the joke. Now you and your husband go out uh, to dinner with another group and you tell them the joke. And you may tell the joke four or five times that day. And it's always fresh for you because it's always to a new audience who hasn't heard it before. So every night the audience comes in and you tell them the joke. You know. <laughs> okay. It's really not that simple, that, but yeah. it's sort of what okay. it is. So and also I'm constantly looking for little tiny improvements and, and polishing things, you know, things of timing and movements and line readings and things like that. And uh, sometimes after a show's been running for six, eight months, I'll think to myself, why couldn't the critics come and see it now, now that I know so many more things than I knew on opening night? You know? So I'm constantly refining and polishing. You know, it's tough because you are out there. It's not like the movies, and we're going to talk about your movies, but on the stage, you're out there, you put yourself on the line every single day and every single night that you're there. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be in top-notch form if you don't feel well or, you know, you've got to be out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you have to bring yourself to 100% every night or whatever you can, you know, like a, like a football player on Sunday. <laughs> okay, but you do, well, obviously it works because I, I mentioned some of the Broadway plays that you were in, Promises, Promises, for which you won a Tony, Six Rooms, Riverview, Carnival. Chicago, I mean, yeah. Chicago, actually I saw you in Chicago too. I saw yeah. all your plays, as a matter of fact, it, it, and, and you were wonderful. Thank you. But you got really good roles. But there were some times, I would think, that you wanted a role that you didn't get. Has that happened? Oh, sure, sure. A lot of times. Uh, God, how many? When uh, they were going to do Funny Girl, and they said to me that I was going to do Nicky Arnstein, that it was, you know, a perfect role. I said, wonderful. And at that time, there were six songs for Streisand and six songs for Nicky Arnstein. And uh, David Merrick was co producing it with Ray Stark, and David sold his interest in it out. So Ray Stark had the whole thing. And Ray Stark's wife was the daughter of Fanny Bryce. And she wanted somebody else. She said, so-and-so looks more like my father. And blah, blah, blah. Well, the fellow that they hired turned out to be not so good. And they started taking things away from him and giving them to Streisand. So she wound up with like 11 songs, and he had one. You, you know, it's <laughs> but I wanted that part. <laughs> there were a couple like yeah. that. You know, I, but I knew that was a big one. And, and I knew about that. And you would have been wonderful as Nicky Arnstein. Well, I would have been right for it anyway. Okay. Now, that was a period of time. That was one disappointment. But it seems that, that maybe at that time, even though you've been very lucky, there were some other disappointments. And that's when you went to Hollywood the first time to yes. go in the movies. But even as you're doing so great now, I hear it wasn't so great then. Oh, no, no, not at all. Because uh, at that time, and even now, it's almost impossible to get on film if you don't have any film to show them, uh, especially if you come from the stage. Now, people would always say, oh, do the national tour of such and such a show because they'll see you in Los Angeles and then you'll get a break in the movies. Well, they'd see you on stage in something and they'd say, yeah, but what's he done on film? 
one has nothing to do with the other. They assume that you can't act on film just because you can act on the stage. It's very difficult, very difficult. Interesting, but you bridge the gap, because it, which proves so today, is that your Eventually, life changed yeah. so much then, as a matter of fact, because you were married then for the first time mm -hmm. um, to Marta, right. I, who you met at Three Penny Opera, yep. had two sons with her. You went out to Hollywood. At that point, you came back. Now you're doing movies, different way, different wife, yes. Elaine, who Elaine. I met. She's not only, she's beautiful, talented, successful. You met her in Chicago. Right, when she replaced Cheetah Rivera. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. So she's really very talented. Oh, yeah. and, and, um, and I will also add again, very beautiful. Um, we're going to talk about your life now. You know, what's been happening with Jerry Orbach. Go into some of the movies, because obviously you're knocking him dead when we come back. Okay. We're speaking with Jerry Orbach. We're here at the Symphony Cafe in New York City, and we'll be right back after these messages. a very moving clip from probably my favorite of your movies but tell us how you felt about that that's interesting because uh, that little piece wasn't even supposed to be in the movie but I asked the director uh, I said I got to resolve this character I want want him to apologize and to make it up with his daughter so I kind of made up a couple of lines there when I'm wrong I say I'm wrong and I called her by her real name instead of baby and we finished the character for me which helped a lot you know and it turned out to be a nice finish for the movie. Yeah, you know, Dirty Dancing was a big surprise to a lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> uh, was it also a surprise to the people who were in it, who were making it? Oh, yes, because uh, it was done on a low budget. They gave me a little piece of it. And uh, all of a sudden, the thing went through the roof. You know, it sold more, ca it sold albums. The cast albums, the track soundtrack, was second in history only to Saturday Night Fever. I mean, things like that. It did all over the world, just a gigantic hit. You know. That's it, and the music is wonderful, but interesting in that role again, even though you're a musical comedy star, that's where it started, that's where it's still <laughs> happening. People who see that movie don't know Jerry Orbach sings or dances. No, no. But they see him as a dad. Now, yeah. just a little bit, real life, Jerry Orbach, dad. You have two sons. Yes. Um, how do you relate to that father role in Dirty Dancing in, in real life? Well, uh, I'm not the same kind of father as that guy, uh, but, uh, Fatherhood has been a very, very big part of my life. Uh, a lot of what kept me in New York as the two boys were growing up. Uh, now I have a granddaughter who's nine months old, my oldest son and his wife. Uh -huh. So uh, anyway, the, the boys, uh, the boys sort of grow up by themselves. You know, you can be a good example or a, or a, or a a frightening uh, warning. You know, I was somewhere in between. I guess. <laughs> okay, you know, but 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 interesting because uh, it's not uh, being a. Uh, there was one time you played poker. You learned poker from your dad when you were six. Yes. And uh, I understand that your sons who learned poker when they were six or seven. I mean, Jerry Orbach, not only a musical star, good poker player. Well, they learned to shoot um, pool too. Yeah, yeah, pool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, but here all the vices. You know, so. Family man, good guy, but on the screen, as I mentioned so many times, you're the bad guy. I mean, Prince of the City is the movie that role that actually got you back into the movies. Yes. On a, a good experience. Yes, it was. Uh, it was where people so said, "Oh, wow, he can uh, he can do that," you know. And you were a real tough guy. I mean, there were some scenes in that movie that were really very dramatic. I think the pivotal scene that everybody remembers is me throwing over the desk of this uh, <coughs> this uh, DA. Be because it was the it was the release moment for the audience. The audience was getting so frustrated with all the machinations of the legal system and the police and everything that finally everybody went, hooray, somebody <laughs> did something. <you> know. <laughs> okay, and good experience, and that got you back yeah. to the movies. And, Sitting um, on that, yeah. One favorite movie, also another sleeper. You know, I actually, if you're not sure about a movie, put Jerry Orbach in it, and it'll be a starry movie. <laughs> it'll make a lot of money. FX. 
Yeah, FX uh, was a sleeper because of the title, I think. Nobody knew what it was. They thought it was about science fiction or something, and it was about a special effects man and a kind of a good cops and robbers thing. Hey, there's a scene in there. You play a bad guy who they're trying to hide. Another bad guy. You know, we have to tell people he's a good guy, but scene where you they were putting plaster all over your face. Yes. What did that feel like? Well, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody who's claustrophobic. You know, if you, if you enjoy scuba diving and things like that, it's not so bad. But uh, it's kind of scary when they cover your entire face with plaster. They even did one where my eyes were open, and uh, he layered the plaster up until it could cover the open eyes like that. So your eyes are open inside of this plaster. But uh, it wasn't that terrible. Well, when you talk about scuba diving, another one of your, I mean, we could spend a half hour and I could talk about all the things you've done, <laughs> but another one of yours was Scuba Duba. Scuba Duba, Bruce J. Friedman's play. That was a wonderful, crazy experience. One of the funniest plays I've ever been involved with back in the 60s, and you know, I was 67, I think, all about race relations, and it was the time of Martin Luther King. Cleavon Little played the uh, scuba diver. That was a, that was a very, very funny wonderful play. Yeah. See, that's another thing people in the movies don't know of you as, uh, as a comedian. I mean, your comedy timing is, is fabulous. Well, hey, I, I learned from Mel Brooks. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> well, I used to hang out with Mel for a few years, oh. yeah. We were very close. Mel said, uh, talking about uh, the ridiculousness of comedy or of timing, he said, now this is drama. Get out. All right? This is comedy. Get out. <laughs> See, all it is is it's a beat late. It's just off. Oh, you know. okay. <laughs> okay, well, knowing Jerry Orbach, the little bit that we know him now, you know, uh, in movies, um, on television, uh, where you once had your own hit before, as a matter of fact, a lot of people miss that. But the law and Harry we McGraw, only have a little yeah. time left. For Jerry Orbach, the person, the real guy here now, what would you like to see? What are your hopes and aspirations for, for Jerry Orbach in, in real life for the future? Well, uh... I think that I would like to wind up kind of like Melvin Douglas in being there at age 85 playing grandpa on his deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there's no question you're going to be there, you know, whether, it, but it's Melvin, but I would think you would also want to be up there on the stage singing and dancing too. Well, sure, sure. I'd just like to keep doing it because I love what I do and uh, I get wonderful feedback from people on the street who enjoy things that I've been in, and that's that's what makes life worthwhile. Oh, okay, well, I'm glad that you were here. I'm glad that you're, you will be here <laughs> with us, and I thank you very much for thank spending you, the Robert. time with us, and I thank the Symphony Cafe. We've been here at the Symphony Cafe, which is a terrific restaurant, uh, not only to talk to Jerry Orbach in, but to come to, and I thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I hope that you have enjoyed the time that we spent with Jerry Orbach, and I hope that you'll join me again next week. Meantime, good night. Hope to see you then.